Hello everyone. Today I am working on an R22 walk-in cooler that's not temping. As you can see, we're above 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's start by doing our general checks. So check one, is the evaporator fan running? Yes, it is. Next, we want to make sure uh, our coil's not frozen up. It is not frozen up. Okay, next thing we want to do is check our liquid line solenoid. Now we're just going to peek in here. And as you saw, the thermostat was on the front of the box, but our solenoid is not here. So on the liquid line or at the condensing unit. So my unit is short cycling. All right, so right now it is running, as you can see, and it's going to pull down. And uh, we're going to go off on low pressure switch. You're going to see we're going to check for potential difference on our pressure switch. And you're going to see we shut off and we have uh, line voltage, which is 202 volts across the contacts. That's telling us our pressure switch is open. And here's what our pressure switch is set to. All right, so our pressure switch high event was set to 78 PSI. So what does that mean? So that means when we reach 78 PSI, uh, our contacts will close, which will send power to the condensing unit. Okay, our differential was set to 38 PSI. So what does that mean? It means we take 78 PSI and we use our differential, which is 38 PSI, and that equals 40 PSI. So that means at 40 PSI, our low pressure switch contacts will open and that will cut power to our condensing unit. All right, so the next step is figuring out what our suction pressure should be. So our suction pressure calculation, because we have a TXV, it's a walk-in, it's going to be current box temp minus our EVAP TD, which more or less is going to be our superheat. So our current box temp is 60 Fahrenheit. We subtract our EVAP TD, which on a walk-in is generally going to be 10 Fahrenheit. And that gives us 50 Fahrenheit. So now we go over to our PT chart, 50 Fahrenheit is going to be 84 PSI. And right now we have 40 PSI. Okay, and then our head pressure. The head pressure is going to be a little bit confusing on this because I am in a uh, underground parking lot where we're below 70 Fahrenheit. So it does have a headmaster control. So if we have a headmaster control, I'm looking basically for a 90 Fahrenheit to 95 Fahrenheit saturation. which would give us 165 to 180. All right, so our suction pressure was 40 PSI and it's probably lower than that because uh, the low pressure switch kicked it out. And we're looking for 50 PSI. On our high side, we had 132 PSI and we're looking for a minimum of 165 PSI. If we come over to our pressures chart, uh, low suction, um, low on the high side tells us we have low charge or restriction. So in this case, uh, that pump down solenoid, if it's closed, okay, and it's not letting ref refrigerant through, it's basically becomes a restriction. Um, and I'll, I'll add more to this chart. This chart was more for regions, but it kind of applies to all the same stuff. So what we want to do next is we want to make sure that our solenoid is working correctly and that refrigerant is in fact getting by. All right. How am I going to test this pump down solenoid? So there's two ways you can check temperatures across, um, but I'm going to bypass this low pressure switch because I want to see uh, what else is going on in this system. Are we going to go right into a vacuum? So let's see what's going on. If we go down into a vacuum, you know, that means this thing potentially is not opening or we have no gas in the system and we're flat. Okay. We know we're not flat because look at our pressures. So we've gone below 40. So this thing should have shut off by now, but because we bypassed that switch, which we're doing temporarily only for troubleshooting. Okay, our pressures are coming down. We want to see if we're going to go down to zero. 
Okay, so we're coming down to 23, 22. We're gonna check our sight glass super quickly, and you can see, you know, she's she's flashing like crazy. She's very low. And let's see if our pressures stabilize. They do, we're at 23, which is telling me that that pump down solenoid is doing its job and it's not staying closed. All right, so our final suction pressure ended up being around 24 PSI. So that changes nothing. We're still low and we're low. Okay, we're looking for a leak. Okay, so let me just go over that liquid line solenoid. That part's a little bit confusing. So let's just put a liquid line solenoid in here. All right, and let's just explain how it works. So if this is open, think of it as any kind of valve, a solenoid, a water valve, whatever makes sense in your head. Okay, if this is open, that means, you know, we have no restriction. When this thing closes, what will happen now is we will pump down this way. We will come to here and then we'll come to our compressor. Okay, the compressor will continue to pump. Okay. And then all the refrigerant will be in this section and this section here. So that means everything over here has no refrigerant in it. Okay. So that could almost mimic a low charge. But in our case, um, we jumpered out that pressure switch. We got 24 PSI. If this was closed, this would have went to zero PSI. Okay. Let me just clean this up super quickly. So now secondly, what's, why do we have a liquid line solenoid? Why are we adding more components that are not in a region? Okay, so for two reasons. So my coil is about 100 feet away from my condensing unit. Okay, I don't want to have to run a wire 100 feet from here to here. So I can use a pressure switch. So when this liquid line solenoid is open, meaning there is no flow, this is going to go to zero PSI. Okay, as soon as my condensing unit as soon as my low pressure sees zero PSI, or in our case, it's set to 40 PSI, it's going to stop sending power to the condensing unit, as we explained earlier in the video here. Okay, the second reason is, okay, we're 100 feet away. Our condensing unit is in a cold place. Okay, if we just le let the system equalize and there's refrigerant in these lines here, I need oil to get back here to the compressor. How can I do that? Well, it's easy. I can pump down where there's no longer refrigerant in any of these lines. There's only refrigerant here and in this section here. Okay. That ensures oil return. And then the last benefit is if we have no refrigerant in these lines, guess what? I can make a repair here. If I have 15, 20 pounds of refrigerant, you know, I can make a repair to the system on the low side between the TXV and the compressor. Okay, so we use that to our advantage when we have a lot of refrigerant in the system and the refrigerant is still uh, in good condition. All right, so let's move on to our leak test. Sorry, that was a lot to take on there. Um, I was probably rambling on. It is what it is. You may have to rewatch that three, four times, but let's, let's start with our uh, usual suspect here, the evaporator coil. See if we get any hits. So far, so good. Nothing on the U-bends, nothing on the back of the coil. Nothing there in the pan. And let's come over to the other side here. And you know, it's not in the best condition. This system is you know, well over 20 years old. Um, I'm not getting any hits here. And my H10 is getting a hit here right at the bottom of the coil. Let's go with my DTEC in the exact same spot. It is not picking anything up here. Um, I know my DTEC was a little bit cold. And sometimes it doesn't work great, but I mean, like now it's it's warmed up at this point. All right, so let's put both meters together and see what we get. Uh, this DTEC 3 has been really good to me. I find it finds, right there's the spot, right there. It finds about 95% of the leaks. It is very good. You know, it's very convenient, more convenient than the H10. Um, but I just find that for that 5% of the leaks, I'm not picking up. So this is a really small leak because the H10 is struggling. There we go. We're getting a hit again. So the H10 has been good to me. The DTEC3 has been good to me. When I have these little micro leaks, uh, my H10 is definitely my go-to. Uh, the DTEC is probably 95% hit rate.